We're in a message series about God interacting with humanity. Today we see him doing that through a story, a parable. A parable is simply a story that has a central theme. And in this theme, God brings something home to every one of us. It's true to real life, even though it's not actual or factual. You would expect that this particular story that was read today would be in the book of Matthew, because Matthew was a tax collector. But it's not in the book of Matthew. It's found only in the book of Luke. And it's as if God and Jesus were saying to us, I want you to have a totally non-biased view of this story that Jesus is going to tell you today. So it's written by a historian named Luke. And in this story, he gives us, Luke does, some kind of touch, some kind of ability that he had to communicate religious truth to a non-religious mind. So Jesus, knowing everyone loves a story, begins the story. Once upon a time, there was a Pharisee. And you can almost hear everybody going, ooh, and a tax collector, boo. Yeah, I mean, here it's all said already. Here you've got the two main characters. One of them struts through the main street of society. The other slinks through on his belly at night in a back alley on the way home because he is so hated. One of them, when you meet him on the street, you go, hi, Reverend, God bless you. And the other one, whether you speak it or don't, he feels it. There's this silence that slices as soon as you see the tax collector. You, low, down, sorry excuse of a human being working for the Roman government and lining your own pockets with my tax money. You could just feel the disgust. And so we're going to have a message on the Pharisee and the tax collector. You would expect that the message that is going to come would be in the favor of the Pharisee because he is well thought of in the community. But just the opposite happens. It was Pastor Peter who gave a, a message title to this, and that is unexpected attitudes, because you would expect the attitude of the religious person, like you and me, to be something that everybody would listen to and would respect. But instead, it's the tax collector who comes out on top. He's going to give us some bad attitudes, and he's going to take a baseball bat to the Pharisee. Are you ready? Yes. Here we go. Bad attitude number one, he was confident in his own righteousness. The reason why this story was told, we, we, we have it right there, it was read for us, is that this story is told to some who were confident in their own righteousness and who looked down on other people. So he was confident in his own righteousness. You and I know what that means. Uh, we all have an aura and it precedes us and everybody reads things about us before we even say a word. It's more than body English, it's who we are and we're not hiding anything the way we think we are. This man, just everything about him said, look at me, I am the example of a fine person. And so he goes into the presence of God. He's going to go there in the temple in a little bit with his own righteousness. The number one religion in the world before Jesus' time and while Jesus lived, and it's alive and well right now, is simply this. When you die, do you think you're going to go to heaven? The number one answer in all time has been, I sure hope so. And what would you base that hope upon? Well... I hope that the good I've done outweighs the bad and that the good man upstairs would let me in and a buzzer goes off and it says, that stinks. That stinks before God and man. You will never get there that way. It's by acts of mercy which God has given us, not by works that we have done. Bad attitude number two, he looked down on everybody. 
Here's where the preparation for this message took a very nasty turn for me. I had it all written down, all six points of this message, had it all written down and then came across a quote by a pastor and author and commentator named Warren Wearsby, who recently went home to be with the Lord. I mean, I had this already, except he said this. We should read parables as mirrors, not as windows. And it messed me up big time. Because if you're looking through a window, you can look at the sins of other people and even laugh at them. But the moment it becomes a mirror, all the fun goes out the window. That's what happened to me. And when I went back over these six bad attitudes, what I found was this, folks. I hit six out of six bad attitudes. And I found myself looking into a mirror. See, this one was about looking down on somebody else. It's about a Pharisee, though he is make-believe, that could stand in the presence of God and give God the names of other people and say, I thank you that I'm not that bad. I'm not like that person. I had names. Which means that I had a bad, wrong, stinking attitude before God. Somewhere in the Bible it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. We've earned it. Do you know who said that? A former Pharisee named Saul, who later, during and after his ministry, would say, I am the chief of sinners. I'm now in the presence of God, and I can't name to God one person who I think deserves heaven less than me. And so, there he was. He was looking down on anybody and everybody. If I look down on anybody, I'm looking down on everybody. And that's what Jesus was going after. Bad attitude number three, he went to the temple to pray. You should probably be saying, what's so bad about that? That's where you go to pray. You go on the right day with the right clothes, the right words, the read the right scriptures, and, and say the right prayers. What's wrong with that? That's where you pray. Well, Jesus was going after the heart, after the bad attitude, and that is when we are something different when we go to church and we're at work than we are at home. That is the core of a bad heart attitude. Who we really are shows up not first in public, but in private. My public self is not my true self unless my public self is the same as I am in private. My wife Joy is here today. Don't believe me. Don't believe me if I say this, that my public self is my private self. But if she says, yep, he's the real deal, he's the same at home as you see here, then you can take that to the bank. But if she's honest, she's not going to tell you that because she's got secrets on me. <laughs> Just the same as God has secrets on you and on me. Who we really are is who we are in private. And God was saying to this make-believe Pharisee, you're showing up at church to show off. And you may impress a few other people, but you're not going to impress me. Bad attitude number four, he stood up and prayed. You say, well, what's the matter with that? We stood up to pray. We always stand up to pray in our services. It shows respect for God, unless you're standing up for the wrong reason. It is written in Matthew, the former tax collector, 
chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues to be seen by people. And he went after that bad attitude. Bad attitude number five, he prayed about himself. Have you ever noticed that in the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that he taught us, it's written in the plural, not the singular, so that it does not read, my Father who is in heaven. And it doesn't say, give me this day my daily bread. That's not how he taught us to pray. It's our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, lead us, and, delivers, and deliver us. It's not about me, myself, and I. When I read about this bad attitude and I looked in the mirror, the thought came to me, I wonder what the actual percentage would be if my prayers were recorded, and I believe they are. If my prayers were recorded, what would the actual percentage be that God would say, this percentage you just prayed is about you, and this is about me and my kingdom and my will? I got so under conviction with that thought that I asked God to please help me to live to at least 120 so I could offset what I know, what I know that percentage is. It's dismal. It's embarrassing. How do I know? I looked in the mirror. I looked in the mirror. And I'm telling you, I'm embarrassed before God and my prayers. You may be impressed with some of my prayers, but he isn't. I know somewhere near the percentage. This Pharisee, I'm looking in the mirror now, this Pharisee, it's not about him anymore, it's about me, and I'm looking in the mirror, and he goes before Almighty God and he talks about himself. Me, myself, and I. And Jesus isn't done. Bad attitude number six, he told God how good he was. He recited his own list. I thank you that I'm not like other men. And then he gave a list of don'ts. I don't steal, I don't commit adultery. I don't have a bad job and a disrespectable job. Then he had a list of spiritual accomplishments, including church attendance, fasting twice a week, tithing his income. I think of that old program, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You know, where they go through this little routine and then the host says, final answer. And I see this make-believe Pharisee and I see us standing before God and God is saying, is that your final answer, Pharisee? Um, you got your own righteousness. You look down on sinners. You go to church. You pray out loud. You have a list of good things that you are and a list of good things that you've done. Is that your final answer? And the make-believe Pharisee goes, yes. And I hear a big buzzer going off and I see a trap door opening. And I hear God saying, get that odor away from me. That's a frontal assault on me and my son, and it's a fatal assumption. Next, please. Well, my time is, is up, and the thought just strikes me that I just spent half of the sermon time teaching you poor folks the finer points of how to have a bad attitude. <laughs> Thank goodness. Well, that's, that's the problem with us senior adults. We, we over-talk all the negative and never get around to the good stuff. So thank goodness. Pastor Kevin thought, who am I going to get to offset Pastor Scott? 
Who, who would maybe bring us, get us to the positive and let these poor people leave church with a good attitude? And, and thankfully, he thought of Pastor Peter. There you go. I think, I think that's the ticket. Uh, he's a thoughtful husband. He's a loving, patient daddy. Um, he is a, a beloved member of our pastoral staff. We all love him. He's a kid magnet. He's the children's pastor extraordinaire. Um, I think we need him. I think I need to do a shout out. So, um, Pastor Peter, could you just get your young, buff, bearded, best self up here and clean up this mess that I just created? Welcome, Pastor Peter Torres. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Scott. And, uh, you know, you could really smell a bad attitude from a mile away. And it kind of reminds me of uh, two different places. Um, both can be fixed with the same uh, solution. One is the gym, um, which, yes, I've been trying to go uh, as much as possible. Then the other one's the youth room. Um, and so, you know, both of them, you just get a little bit of ax and you just fix it all. Um, so, but Pastor Josh, I feel like you might, you might need that for, uh, for youth uh, tonight after all that running around they're going to do. But um, thank you, Pastor Scott. Now you see these two people, right? And you really are like, man, you would think this Pharisee, he would be the one setting the right example. And this tax collector, well, he's a tax collector. And so we see two very uh, conflicting attitudes here between these two very different people. And we can learn a lot from both of them. Now, Pastor Scott mentioned that the Pharisee was confident in his own righteousness. He thought that he had it all going right. But we see that the tax collector had no confidence in his own righteousness. He knew probably very little bit about the scriptures, probably didn't practice them. Didn't go to church regularly, but he knew something, he needed something more. This tax collector, knowing full well what he had done his whole life, started his worship from a place of humility. Rather than thinking he was some big shot, high and mighty person, but rather than thinking his righteousness came from the things that he did, similar to the Pharisee, he knew that his righteousness could only come from one place, and that was God. We can also see from the scripture that the Pharisee looked down on everybody, but the tax collector, on the other hand, he was looked down on by everybody. No one liked tax collectors. They were seen as cheaters and thieves. I just started watching the Chosen TV show, and they had the Roman guards that had to go with them because they literally were threatened by the people because they were so hated. As I was going through Facebook a couple weeks ago, I came across this picture. Now, I don't, I don't know why the, this guy resembles Jack Black. Um, it just, it is. Um, but you see him sitting here and he's reading the Bible, telling God like, hey, my heart is yours. And then we see these nicely dressed people with their shirts and ties you know, they got their Bibles and they're, they're just judging this guy. Maybe they know his past. Maybe they know what he's done. Maybe they just don't like the way he looks because he's like, oh, I'm motorcycle guy, whatever. Okay. They don't like something about him and they think that he should not be there for whatever reason it may be. They're judging him. First Samuel chapter 16, verse seven says, the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Everyone was looking at the tax collector the way that they're all looking at our Jack Black lookalike here. As Christians and representatives of Christ, we should be lifting everyone up, not looking down or better yet, elevating their sins to cover our own. Maybe that one stung a little bit. Let me sink my heel in a little bit more. I think that sometimes we like to point out other people's flaws, other people's mistakes, other people's sins to distract from the things that we've done. And what better place than church to do that? In reality, Jesus calls sin, sin. 
We need to stop judging and looking down on others just because of what they look like or maybe what their pasts are like. People searching to find Jesus. We should be encouraging them. The next observation we make is that the tax collector stopped outside the temple to pray. Given the opportunity, the Pharisee would have taken great pride in stopping the tax collector. But the tax collector didn't give the Pharisee or the other worshipers a chance to block him from coming and having a relationship with his father in heaven. He takes yet another humble uh, position of worship and realizes that he can still worship from outside, that he can still bring what he has before God and doesn't need to be inside the temple making a scene. By stopping outside, he can worship and pray without the worry of anyone else looking and, see, looking and seeing him. Everyone went to the temple to pray so that they could show that they were being a good Christian, right? That they tithed and that they did all these things. They fasted. Often we think, okay, I have to go to church today. I check off my box for the week. And yes, it's great to be here and we need to be in fellowship with other believers. But the fact of the matter is that our Christian life, our walk with God goes far beyond these walls. It's not something that we just come on Sunday mornings and say, here's my worship, God. Here's my 10%. I'm going to go back into the world and do what I do. It goes beyond these walls. It's the way we live. It's how we live. It's what we do. He also could have stopped right outside the entrance of the temple, but instead he stood at a distance. Maybe because he really wanted to just be alone with God. Maybe out of fear of what people might think. But he did what he had to so that he can connect with his father in heaven. Then we see that rather than praying about himself like the Pharisee did, he began to pray about his own sins. Says that he began to beat his breast. Now this is something that in our culture today we don't necessarily do. Maybe like reflex or something you might do. But this was a sign of extreme remorse, guiltiness, sadness that people would do in Bible times. And so we know that the heart is the central part of the human body and we see that both good and evil come from the heart. Sin comes from the heart and it's not necessarily an act of trying to hurt yourself and some religions call it like a penance, like you're physically trying to hurt yourself as a a consequence of something you've done. Rather, this is the tax collector acknowledging the self-realization that his sin is coming from his heart. That his heart had done something wrong against not just him, not against others, but against God. And so he's making the self-realization, I have sinned. I have done wrong. And finally, he starts to, to beg God for forgiveness. He didn't try to justify his sins with good works, the very little he maybe had. Rather, he acknowledges his wrongs and lays them out for God to deal with. I grew up with two younger siblings. I was the oldest. And uh, a lot of times, I was the one that liked to test the boundaries. I liked to learn the rules for my younger siblings. Good brother, right? Good big brother. Um, And so I would usually get in trouble for them. I know you're like, Peter, that's not you. That's not you. Beside the point, um, we won't go into the gray hairs that I caused my parents. But when I would get in trouble the few times, um, I would always do what most kids would do. If you have kids, you would understand teens, take notes, because I was a professional at this. You try to divert the attention from yourself, right? Try to get it on something else. Well, I know I didn't pass the test. Yeah, I didn't study, but I, I, mom, I cleaned the house. Come on. 
I put my laundry away after two months of it sitting in the closet. It's not under my bed anymore. Or even better, if you do have siblings, well, he was on the Xbox and I heard him calling a kid dumb. She didn't clean her room. And we tried to divert the attention and trying to justify our sins. The wrong things that we've done, we tried to distract from it. But instead, this tax collector, he stands there in God's presence, where he's at, and he lays it out. Not trying to justify it. He gives it to God, knowing full well that only God is the one that can deal with those sins. Not the Romans, not the Pharisees, not anybody around, but only God can deal with the sins in his life. Nothing that he could do, nothing that you or I could do could make us good enough. And the tax collector got that and knew he needed to just give that over to God. And that's what he did. He humbly offered his sins to God. And we see that at the end of this parable, he is the one that ended up walking away justified. Justified. The tax collector didn't believe he was worthy to be there. He didn't think he belonged there. And that's because he really didn't. And if we're being honest, none of us really deserve to be there. Maybe today you're sitting here and you feel like you don't deserve to be here. But in reality, we don't. But that's the great news of the gospel. That God has made a way that not just Pharisees, not just tax collectors, not just pastors, not just normal people. Everyone has an opportunity to have a relationship with God and can come before him. Maybe there's others of you who are a little too comfortable. You've been to church so long and you're surrounded by the Christian bubble that you forgot that there's actually people out there that still need Jesus and they don't have a relationship with God and they might not have the right clothes or say the right things. Maybe you have an entitled spirit like the Pharisee and you've taken this time and you feel like you're looking in a mirror I've been going to church my whole life. I know all the scriptures. What is that guy? Oh, he's, don't look at me. Look at him. He's got all the things wrong. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, man, my attitude is stunk. Take the time and get it right. Take the example of the tax collector. God made it available for all of us to come before him. The humility of the tax collector, it was the starting point of his relationship with God. But we don't need to stay in that sorrowful, guilty, sad place. God allows us to become confident and bold in our righteousness through him that we don't have to say, stay saddened. Yes, we come before him humble, but we also come before him bold, knowing that what he did on the cross is for each and every one of us, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been. Be, hum be humble, but be confident. We all need God, no question about it. We need to keep humble and keep seeking him because we all need him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lives in this room, God. God, as we go from this place, I pray that you would be with us. God, if we've come in here and we're, we're feeling kind of down, God, like we, we might have had a bad attitude, God, I pray that you would lift us. Help us to see the example that the tax collector set in this parable, Father God. That we would be able to take that and realize, you know what? We could do better. Whether we've followed Jesus our whole life, or whether we're maybe sitting here and never thought about it. God, you've made it available for us all to have a relationship with you. I pray that we would take that opportunity, that we would look in the mirror, and that we would do what we need to do to 
to fix that attitude, to turn it around, to get rid of that funk, God. So that when people see us, the lives that we live are true and pure, God. That we would live with integrity. That our humility would come before all and that we would be confident knowing that you have saved us. Be with us, Father. Help us to go into this world this week and the rest of our lives carrying your truth with us and that we would impact the world with our attitudes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.